I'd like to welcome back to the stage, Deborah Granick. Thank you. So I guess, I guess I wanted to start by asking you um, kind of the world you create for them before, even before the invasion of the Rangers is, is so kind of defined and pristine and um, perfectly executed and both their inner and outer world. And I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about building that piece of the movie and what your thought process was there, what the scripting process was there, et cetera. So for making this film become vivid and making a space for Tom and Ben to begin to navigate that campsite and understand the forest and for her to explore, it took, we had to make sure there was a lot of time before filming for them to do their own rehearsals at that site. And even before they got to that site, uh, we were given really wonderful permission and access by the ranger of this particular park, which is right outside of Portland. Um, and so they were really allowed to explore. Um, we, as the production, picked the site, but then within that, they started to place things and figure out how they would operate out of that site. And a primitive skills trainer uh, worked with them for two days. Her name is Nicole Lapellian, and she was uh, kind of a champion level uh, primitive skills expert and an outdoor survivor who had um, done 45 days on Vancouver Island off of the coast and you know, through this similar kind of weather and what with two with two knives she and she really um, she was very inspiring to Ben and Tom and they they selected knives with her and then she they trained how to use them safely they figured out how you know she taught how to do the feather sticking so that they could create tinder how to create tinder when from jute from different substances what to forage how to then light the fire and it was determined that Ben would um, you know get good on the ferro stick so he could s you know strike metal and create those sparks so he wouldn't have to use matches and um, so that skills training was really rich for them and that enabled them to then feel that they could walk in those shoes just a little bit and do those things do them when needed exchange things it, it also helped them build traction you know, when you've really got the fire, then then instead of, it's not all scripted, right? When you've got the fire, then it's time to put the pot on because it will boil. When you really see the eggs are boiling, then you really, you know, remove them. So just having things be real process enable them to be right there, very present to the given circumstances. Is that kind of in line with the way you direct them a as actors, the holistic process? I mean, there's there's kind of an amazing just tension between them and relationship between them and, and doesn't feel like it has a false note and so much of it is unspoken. Um, do, do you direct them to be that way through through the same sort of kind of physical process of, of the realistic setting? I, mean, I do try to make that, you know, so that when they were hiking, it was it was really raining. You know, there's no rain machines on this film. <laughs> and um, so their clothes are getting wet and they are feeling things when they have to build that emergency shelter that's an arduous process and um, that was again where Nicole came in you know no one no one on our side of things knew how to build an actual true emergency shelter which which branches you know which which uh, hemlock being more water resistant you know what branches to use etc and so once Ben knew those things so deep in the film he he felt very invested you know he was able to see what he was doing and understand what he was doing um, he could then feel he could say to her you know we don't use the lines but he we did shoot some lines where he was aware of where he was in the process you know um he he was very steeped in what how the onset of hypothermia so he kind he he gave some cues to her about what you know what he wanted you know to her to keep the coat on and not use her hands he saw that she had less dexterity and um so yes all along it was important for them to feel, if they're at the Christmas tree farm, that they're there, that he's really with that crew in the field. So I do, in every place that it's possible, I'd like to be able to provide that. Um, I want to ask you one more thing, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, I, I mentioned kind of in the intro introduction about this documentary you had made um, about the Vietnam War, but and I was wondering if that influenced you a little bit in, into coming into this project and, and how it informed what you did here. It did indeed, it, uh, you know. Um, so I had the opportunity to spend time in southern Missouri after I made Winter's Bone, 
with one of the people who had been very helpful in the making of that film. He was a local who I had met in a chance encounter, and I asked him if he would be in the film. He, he, he really had a great kind of presence for the role, and he said yes, and then he informed me about some aspects of the role that he thought you know, he had uh, some knowledge of from his lived experience, and it really wasn't till after, and when he came to the set, he was wearing you know, his leather vest, and he had a lot of Vietnam regalia on it, and he had a very large map of Vietnam on his arm, and I knew there was a story there, obviously, and, and after the film wrapped, and I, was, I just went to merely say goodbye and thank him, because he had been tremendously helpful. He had brought a lot of friends and neighbors to populate the scene, uh, and just was helpful in every way he could be. And it's in his yard, just really displayed from left to right was just his chapter of American history. You know, he'd come of age in Southeast Asia. Uh, it was a sort of hard scrabble living. It was an RV community that he owned and operated. Eight RVs. Some people, you know, he could he could deal with slow returns. Some not everyone could pay their rent. They could pay tiny rent, which he could deal with. He just had to pay their water bill really off of it and their propane. Um, so similar to Dale, the Dale character that Tom meets, and then there was his Harley. He was riding to the memorial. Um, he had very small dogs, and then he informed me that many vets have extremely small dogs. You know, the opposite. Maybe you think they're going to have big dogs. So he talked to me about um, sort of, you know, without using any kind of jargon about animal therapy, the dog. You know, not not. It's it's very become very widespread knowledge that it's been extremely helpful. Um, with that, with that well-being, to have uh, animal companions, so everything, and then of course he had, of course he had a, a you know his love, his new the ardors, the ardor and passion in his life was a woman he had met in Mexico, so he's in a town that maybe like five years before I was filming him, maybe would have been very fright and frightened of Mexicans arriving, and but he was madly in love with her. And then, he and then a like a year later into filming, we find out that she has these two emo twin sons in Mexico City. They come to this third world situation in southern, in southern Missouri, which shocks the heck out of them. Um, but so that, that, what, what that taught me was um, that there are communities that where there is definitely a practice of live and let live, where people way before tiny houses can have lived for decades in small dwellings, and then if it's done with certain kind of community and care and with certain circumstances, it can be done well, it can be done safely, sanely, people can function, there can be a community that um, where there's some thriving, even though it's a hard scrabble. So he, he, he elevated a lot of things for me and shined the light on things that I, I would have not known about had, I, had he not been willing to spend time and kind of co-create this portrait with me, or, or me and my, and my colleagues. Um, but what I, th I think the influences were uh, becoming ever more interested in what the legacy of combat is in the mind or body of a person that participates in it. You know, it was no, no news. You know, he, he was steeped in knowledge from the Greeks in World War I, but Vietnam was so gnarly because we acted like no one knew, like it was like a big surprise, you know, that, that, that this, this invisible, you know, th they had to come up with a name finally because, you know, um, the United States was in such denial about it. Um, and so steeping this idea that, uh, and he was, and he also he had ra raised a daughter, you know. So that was also interesting as a single father. Um, so all those things were very influential in the backstory of Will. And of course, then the Sand War veterans uh, and the literature that's been more recent aided and abetted that understanding. And, but Stray Dog always was willing to talk about it. And it made me understand that um, this, this war was no different and that, that we now have a very large generation of men and women this time who have, are holding a, wh a whole bunch of history inside their conscience and are struggling, yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna open it up to the audience. Does anybody have any questions? A quiet, stunned house right here. <laughs> so 
to the question was just so the whole room can hear it. Yeah. The question was about Thomason's remarkable performance and how you found her. So Tom is from New Zealand. I don't know if everyone knows that. She has a really robust Kiwi accent. She <laughs> um, and she uh, is someone who had read the script and submitted an audition from a great distance. And at first I thought, wow, this is a low-budget film. No, no chance that we can work with someone from a different hemisphere. That was just sort of never under consideration. And her audition really stuck with me. I, I was looking at young women that um, on both coasts who had been involved either in Broadway on the east or um, in LA in, in industry on the west coast. And through many different days of auditioning, I kept thinking back to Tom. And then I had a conversation with her from th through Skype. And we ended up talking. And I realized she had had very deep reading of the script and the novel. And these were just very enticing qualities. That's, uh, I mean, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a collaborator. And then based on our conversation, she went off and self-taped a few other improvs that were, you know, ideas from the script that we had talked about. And it wasn't that I'm, you know, ticking boxes and she's impressing me. She is. But it was, it was that I could see that she's just enjoys, you know, no one had to tell her to do that. No one had to, and that's how it was working with her. No one has to tell Tom. Tom's in the spirit. She immerses. She's young enough to still have her imaginary worlds intact. She could act as if. She could be, and we chose to keep her name. That in the script she was called Caroline, and that was in the novel. And uh, during the rehearsal period, hearing Ben call her Tom, hearing the crew call her Tom, I you know it just struck me so hard. I just said, Tom, is there any chance that you'd be comfortable using your real name? You know, in this, I think it, it suits you. <laughs> you know, no doubt. Um, you know sort of, I said, you know, should, should we talk to your mom about this, you know, <laughs> just to see if she thinks it's like, would, would mess with your brain in any way, you know, and got the all clear on that. So we, s we so, you know, she's bringing a lot of herself, you know, uh, the qualities that you're seeing there, I mean, Tom doesn't live a lifestyle such as that, even though she assures me that it's rugged in Wellington, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the genera generosity of spirit, the open hearted qualities that you see in this fictional Tom are very mar part of Thomason. Any other questions? Over here. So the two questions were, what is her age? And um, did you meet the character or the actress? Oh, no, the age. Yeah, Thomason's age. And, and, um, and, uh, was the movie based on a true story? So when we filmed, Tom was 16, yeah, and she was, we were thinking of her as, you know, somewhere in the range of 14 to 16, you know, j and um, and it is based on a true story. There was a, a newspaper article in the Oregonian newspaper, which is Portland's newspaper of record, and the father and daughter had been found, and they had been living there undetected for quite some years, and the rangers were very impressed, and um, it there had been other, there had been some precedent for people dwelling a long time in Forest Park undetected, but you had to be really conscientious and adroit and specific and disciplined. They weren't leaving rubbish, you know, their, their camp and the inventory of their camp was published and it's much what you see here and, and the adaptation of the novel was based on the article. So this has gone through a lot of, I don't want to call it a telephone game, but so there's an article based on empirical, you know, observational things that are noted then the a novelist Peter Rock does an adaptation and a fictionalization, and then we inherit the novel and do an yet another version. Um, but the facts that were known were that they had been living there. Um, there were a lot of books in their camp, so there was a, you know, a, a practice of going to the library, borrowing books, returning them. Um, he did have a very, very like small disability, like a twenty percent disability stipend so he had they lived very frugally and budgeted themselves and she was above grade level so the teaching that had gone on and the fact that she read really well these were all things that the social workers sort of thought were, were quite unusual right it, it, it was not the immediate stereotype of an unhoused family uh, that could only be seen as down and out there were some things that were working in their in their system and so that's but that's all that's known the story stops there, and, and then her record was sealed because she was a minor, so 
that's there's not much else I think known. Uh, over here, I'm told we have mics that are coming. Okay. To okay. <laughs> The question was about the actors and kind of their getting back their journey, their transition back into normal life from becoming these characters. So that's one thing that actors have that us, you know, that civilians don't have, right? Actors can make a transition, I believe. Mm, I, they have tools. I don't, you know, I, I'm not privy to all of what that is that can enable that. Um, I will say, I will get to your point, but um, the skills expert, Nicole, talked about all the other people that had been on the show alone with her. They did have extreme difficulty coming back. And to some extent, I think, but with, with uh, people that stayed out a long time, the transition, and that was one thing that the show had to make an adaptation for. It's almost like soldiers coming back as well that the show had to then give a transition time. They had not. Uh, so people that had survived 45 days or 30 days or even 20 days were plunked back you know, in their regular lives and, and some of them actually unraveled. It was very, it was, there was one or two stories that were quite heavy. So they did a different procedure for reentry but your point is really well taken, and I think you know. I think Ben would say more, you know, in a uh, lighthearted, a little bit of a lighthearted way. For him, it was it, you know he was getting a, a big sense of pleasure and from seclusion, from being deep in the forest, uh, being ensconced, and that is different than his urban life. And I think, um, but because uh, because of this transition, they can make you know th th they have to turn off something every single night to even go home, right, to function. So that would be a question I, I think only actors could ask. Uh, answer answer to you is like you know oh no I I'm I'm just I'm just I have to stay humble here you know <laughs> I can't know that but but it's an interesting query you raise over here. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, other than you've mentioned changing the character's name, were there any other changes that you made, for example, to the story after casting or why you, while you were shooting? Uh, very, yes, yes, there were many changes. So, N Nicole, the trainer's presence, uh, and, you know, I, I did not know some of those things. It was, I had spoken with her at the script stage, and so, I had some ideas, and those were outlined, but then seeing the level at which um, some of those skills had to be done, and then noting, like, when we got to the, um, and even just like that, the, the presence of the ferro rod, you know, just the fact that it would become a through line. I, I, d I didn't know that setting out. I didn't know that it would be important for him, for her to give it back to him. You know, it was only after seeing it being used in the film, and no, no, noticing that, it w I mean, or noting, n could help but note that it was so uh, indispensable to being able, you know, fire your your friend in that s in, a, in that sense of survival. So, um, so details like that, I, um, you know, then there's quirky things that you can't predict. Um, we that that village at the end where we film, where Dale um, is the sort of kind of female embodiment of stray dog, really, you know, um, running this RV park. Uh, it, the real life location is a nudist colony. And it's a bohemian, it's been, it's a very sweet, very Oregonian situation there. <laughs> very live and let live. Um, it used to be an old logging camp. And then after, and there's still one of the, the oldest man, sort of the mayor, he's an old logger. He's, a, he's in one of those little enchanted cabins. Um, so it's, it's been around for a long time. And so one of the concessions there, you know, I, I, I would have never said, oh, well, everyone's going to wear a bathrobe. But so they said, you know, 
you're welcome to film here. And our concession, we'd love you to film here. We're enjoying this. This is interesting to us. Please come, you know. Uh, and we will voluntarily wear bathrobes <laughs> so that you can film here. And it'll be, you know, so, you know, you don't know it until after the film. I, 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 most people don't realize that everyone in that town, in that the little village scene, except for Dale, is wearing a bathrobe. <laughs> um, so that that's something you know the costume designer never would say n would never call out you know everyone at Squaw will be wearing a bathrobe. <laughs> um, so that's like those are those moments that are given to you that that. Um, so there are many things that happen. Wonderful little droplets of serendipitous things that happen during the course of a film. It's not only the negative ones, <laughs> like weather changes that you can't accommodate. We learn to accommodate everything. If you're going to shoot in the Pacific Northwest, expect rain. Sun is anomaly. When it happens, at least the characters can sort of respond to it somehow, or you can build it in somehow. But you can't, you know, you, you, um, that film was going to teach us about a very deep form of flexibility. <laughs> um, right down here, we have a mic coming for you, so just hold on one second. If you have a question, leave your hand up, and um, one of the mic guys will find you. Hi. So uh, there are three things in this uh, this movie of yours that uh, I found really interesting. One, it's like a came of come of age story with the girl. Uh, second, there's this person living off the grid, and the this control that society has to exert over them, and. Uh, I'd like you to talk about uh, a little bit about that. And finally, there is the difference between the first place, the place where they put them, that's not a very happy place, and that other place with this quirky old folks, and that is very interesting with the music and everything where the girl feels she can live. So if you can tell something about those three things, I uh, don't have to say much, just. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so I mean. Undeniably coming of age story. There's no doubt about it, um, because of the need to of Tom to understand this uh, parent in her life and see, you know, note what he struggles, understand it on a profound level, and then begin to understand what it means to feel differently or to ha feel that she has maybe a different set of needs or is comfortable in a different kind of setting, seek, seek is seeking something else. So cleaving yourself from someone that's been your primary teacher and who, for whom you care so deeply, and vice versa, you know that that is one of for some people that will be the most formative part of coming of age. Is is you know, and it's quite you know, it's happens to most sapien sapiens. You know, it's 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 that it's that universal. But the fact is, I l I like the way the novelist had put that put that story forward, um, and then in terms of the social, the forces at play, I, you know, it, it magnified itself as we were filming, as we were writing this, the, the idea that uh, in a digital era, in that even, how does anyone think their own thoughts? Like his words became very precious to me. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm attempting like many people to raise a kid in this era. And so this notion of how, that, that question he puts out, you know, what does it take to think your own thoughts? And and then you see it is actually uh, it's quite intense. I mean, to to actually really be able to um, sequester yourself in any way these days is it's changing landscape on us, right? And uh, you know, as much as he might have referenced Walden and and philosophers uh, either south of the border or up here, you know, that have contemplated what it would mean to simplify life and how little you do need to be happy or what do you need to be happy. These are questions he's interested in and it's extremely hard to answer them right now with the amplified chatter and the um, sort of hyper messaging of our world. So I, I agree that the social forces were are, in, are really, and they're just in ones and zeros. They're invisible on some level and, they're n and, and yet they're so ubiquitous. So. Uh, and then the last part about, you know, I did feel, um, I did feel excited about places, l little niches, little, little, s little places that where people decide that they will follow a few tenets of things that would make their life worth living. They can't do it all, you know, it's not, they're not off the grid, that, that village is, 
a mixture of things, but I guess it was that they were seeking a little space to live a little closer to how they wanted to be, and and that and that's not lost on her. And um, and I think she's very attracted to the the way that Dale is modeling adulthood. You know, that there's something that she's drawn to there. We have time for a couple more. I have one right here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, how did you approach? the idea of a character who's constantly finding a home versus a character who seems like he never will find a home. The restlessness of never being happy, never finding his place. Well, you know, I think um, that's one of the gnawing kind of tragic feelings of the story in the sense that, almost again using that word malleable, that, you know, this really ancient proverb, right, that the, the malleable can survive and the brittle get broken. And it was always, it, I felt sorrow at times thinking about brittleness and how fragile someone becomes, sort of how robust curiosity can, can make her, and that she was really increasing in her strength and her, her sense of wonder and interest in the world. And he was, I think, receding and, and became fragile. His hypervigilance was sort of flowing into more of a paranoia and... I think when he felt pursued, when he had been unhinged and, and uprooted from something that was working, you know, he had carefully put together a lifestyle that was working for him. I think it's more debatable how it was how it was for her, but the fact is, he was on top of his game. He had his self worth was being very much fueled by being this very meaningful guardian and teacher to his daughter. So then, when that's pulled out, pulled out, he's in a very precarious situation. I think he, so he becomes, you know. Uh, increasingly, like my sensitivity towards his situation was increasing as writing in, in writing the process and then and then watching it get filmed, and I think that was actually really hard for Ben. That's that's a hard place to be. It was a very um, th living with that fragility. <coughs> it's not comfortable. We all want to be on top of our game. You know, we don't want to be as vulnerable as he becomes. So th I mean, there was definite strong emotions that were playing out, I think. We have time for one more right here. Hi, thank you for your extraordinarily beautiful film. Um, I love that there were no bad guys. <laughs> it was very um, generous to everyone in the film. So I don't really have a comment. I just want to say it, it's, very, uh, um, it's a very optimistic film in terms of the, the human spirit and deeply beautiful. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, you know, I think with um, with no villains, boy, that you know, that was uh, there was a day of reckoning. Where I, you know, a couple of screenings in with some close colleagues, just just intimate screenings, work screenings, um, and you know, asking amongst m you know me, others, can you make a film without a villain? Like, wh where's the where's the suspense? Where's the fuel for it? You know, where, and I, you know, and then and this turned out that the, it's not that it's a villain, but the force that is compelling or that is pushing that's anxious is, you know, can they find what they're looking for, right? It's the search, it's the, or it's like the power of social conformity that really does want to bring people back in the fold. You know, we don't, we're but not- Even the social know. conformers were kind-hearted people. Well, that was, uh, that was something that the research borne out, you know, bore out. They were written a little differently. And uh, in the, in the, even in the novel, the social workers were a little bit more the man, or they were the more the, you know, the problem, oh, they, they, they they were more taxing, and but then talking to social workers, I was, I was like, wait, a minute. reality check. Most people become social workers because they want to perform positive interventions. Yeah. <laughs> Am I really going to throw social workers under the bus? How's that? <laughs> you know, how's that going to really feel? That I'm not going to have a good conscience on that one. Like, why? Because that's not really. It, things get m messed up, and uh, child welfare is a really gnarly subject matter, and and there there's. A lot of things that can run uh, astray in that process, in any in any liberal welfare state, you know. Or, and I feel like social realists have really done beautiful work about that in the UK, you know, uh, Ken Loach and other filmmakers. Um, but in this situation, the research told me how many social workers do I need to talk to to realize that I got the language of how they would handle things, things they would want to know, things they would have to see. You know, they weren't out to get her or him. You know, so that uh, that became something I had to factor in, even if it was going to sort of compromise.
the clarity of who's bad and good. Turns out there's a lot of ands, right? Most people would like to help another person if they can. Yeah. And so then, of course, come 2018, come the, elec come the election, come what happened, seeing uh, less villains is suddenly a B-A-L-M. You know, it's a, it, we need it, right? <laughs> you know? um, well, I want to thank you so much for coming and bringing the film to us. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. And what a great... What a great city to screen a film in. Gotta come back. Yeah.